So, all right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our second user meeting. And I see a lot of familiar faces here today. Glad to see you guys again. Uh, so let me introduce myself a little bit, just for those who joined the user meeting for the first time. Uh, my name is Xiang, and I'm one of the engineers behind Kuzu team. And my area of expertise is in primarily in query processing and query optimization. So back to today's uh, user meeting, um, we'll structure this one in the same way as our previous one, which means we'll start by reviewing what are the features that have been added since the previous uh, previous meeting. So in the past two months, we have published three more releases. Two of them are major feature release, and the other one is a bug fix release. So after that, we'll give you a preview of our next release, essentially about what are the things you can expect in September. And finally, we will revisit our 2023 roadmap. Uh, we have made some changes based on our progress as well as uh, user feedback. So here is a list of things that we presented last time in the first user meeting. We said we were going to focus on these five aspects. So being feature complete towards OpenCypher, a new storage design, a native RDF support, more language bindings, and more integrations with other ecosystem. So throughout this presentation, you can expect updates on each and every aspect of them. So let's start with what are the new Cypher features that are being added in the past two months. So we'll start with path, which is probably the most wanted feature based on user feedback. So we now have a full support on named path. You can define a path variable and bind it to a regular graph pattern or you can define a path variable and bind it to a recursive pattern or defining even multiple paths within a single match clause as shown here in the, in the, in the last example. And of course, just defining a path variable doesn't make it very useful. There is also a set of path functions coming along together with this named path. So we also implemented nodes and rails functions, which returns all the nodes and edges from a path. These two functions actually come from a, Open Cypher standard, so you can find more about them both on our website and on new 4 website. And a path by default does not can have arbitrary number of repeated nodes or repeated edges. And depending on your use case, this may not be an expected behavior because the application might expect a path that doesn't contain any cycles. So we but, also uh, uh Shang, there's a question I think from Martin. Martin, you don't need to raise hands, just you can just interrupt directly. Oh, cool. Okay, sorry, I didn't didn't want to to, to, to be rude, but but one question I have is that is is do you have any plans or or is there any any thoughts of kind of extending this? Because one thing I've seen that has been discussed quite a bit also on the on on the Slack is this idea of um, like post processing the results either in in like using DuckDB in Arrow or 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 using network X or whatnot, but do, do you kind of see any of these post-processing tasks more as like that can be done in other libraries or would you, because I think I actually asked for some of these things, this acyclic and whatnot, which has been super useful. Um, and for instance, in the in the network, network X um, case, there is code there that kind of deduplicates and returns only the unique set of, uh, of nodes and, and edges and essentially paths. So, do you have any plans to extend this? I guess this is more like utility functions uh, that that I think uh, you know would be useful since we are uh, actively adopting Rust uh, for many performance reasons. But we also see that the client libraries uh, might lack a little bit of the features, and obviously Python has has most most of them. So uh, obviously, I would be really happy to see maybe more of this utilities and functions that, that do this type of processing. Uh, but curious if that you see that as your responsibility uh, or if that's something more uh, that can be done elsewhere. So can I can I ask a clarification question? So are you asking a question about paths, like this path fun path feature that uh, Xiang is talking about that got in that got added to uh, our Cypher implementation? Uh, sorry, I was realizing I was talking maybe more than asking asking a question, but no. But what I'm asking is, um, let's say maybe a specific one is uh, deduplicating the let's say result set in some way, because from what I understand, the the uniqueness at the moment is more about the input data, but not necessarily if you want to take all of the outputs and and 
let's say get all the unique nodes and paths or, or something like this but maybe maybe i'm just being un un unclear i don't know just kind of see this that there we often have a need to do a bit of post processing uh, where it's often about what are the unique nodes and edge pairs and, and whatnot if you're let's say going to draw the graph uh, for instance yeah so i think um in general we are not uh, against doing utility functions as long as there is no ambiguity in terms of their syntax like the the, the example that you have in mind of uh, returning a like distinct uh, node and edges is essentially re re returning a like a subgraph type of thing that does not contain any repeated node and edges and uh it's uh its syntax is could like we we we, we did discuss this internally before, but I think the, the problem is the syntax itself is not uh, kind of overlap with the distinct uh, keyword you would see in a, in, a, in, a, in SQL or other relational system, but those distinct will directly apply to, to, to all the rows or tuples you get from your result table. So, but, uh, so I think this, this is a good point. So like for the case of where you're returning a query result and you want to call two network X function on it, right? Now, um, for some of even our use cases, like Chung isn't here, but Chung is doing graph viz. He'll need to be able to take the query results and somehow convert it into a subgraph where you only have, you don't want to repeat the nodes and edges. So that will be implemented somewhere in Chunk's pipeline. So I think maybe if I understand Martin's question, could those be exposed as some utility functions that you do over um, in, or like a, maybe as a parameter to network X or as another function call in Python and not in Cypher because maybe some of these are not easy to do in Cypher. I think that that might make sense and that they could be useful things. Well, we can discuss a bit more actually, maybe offline. But uh, Martin, is this roughly the what what you meant? Uh, no, I actually meant more if this could be made available in Cipher in some way. But I think the reason why I'm also cautious about it is because I know that this could also very easily lead to ambiguity, as 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 was mentioned, and also maybe extensions or or almost making the Cypher implementation dirtier than kind of following the, the convention. So that's why I'm also, I'm asking, but also kind of being wary that if the answer is no, that should be more a client library or or a pro like the, the client library or programming language bindings, then then that's also like a good answer. Then it's more than, you know, understanding kind of what, what your thoughts are. But I think I got the answer. Young's principle that unless the semantics is clear that we wouldn't implement yeah. it in Cypher makes sense. But it might be case by case. We'd need to see what functions are clear, what functions are not. Uh, but some of these things I think are common and we might all already be implementing it somewhere, some of these functions. And we might wanna write them in a way so that they're usable. I think that makes sense. I just want to add a very minor comment here. Like, so Xia is going to introduce the way that you can create UDF or micro in Cypher in language bindings. So maybe some easy uh, utility functions, we don't need to have them as built-in ones, but like you can uh, write UDF functions freely and they can just run as built-in functions as efficient as they can out there. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. I mean, that would actually be, be super helpful because then it just feels like you maybe lose some performance or something, especially if you have, let's say, a large result set that you want to do the duplication of processing, being able to do that within the same memory space and kind of of, of the the query that's already running would would seem a lot better. But but because the UDFs are more like script, like there's a scripting language uh, that that you know would be more imperative than the declarative kind of cipher syntax. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Maybe let's move on. This is I think we uh, we can discuss this more. We understood. Yeah. General, sorry. Sorry. General comment. Yeah. Okay, so, so let me continue on this uh, path function. Uh, so we expose this ace trial and acyclic functions. Trial and acyclic are terminologies from graph theory. Uh, trial means a path cannot have repeated edges, and acyclic means a path cannot have a repeated node. So these two things are not part of Open Cipher, but instead they are part of a uh, GQL standard. And GQL standard is a graph query language standard that is under development among multiple graph database companies. So this 
notion of trial and ASICT has already appeared in the draft version of uh, GQL standard. And also finally, we have this uh, properties function, which returns a specific property of uh, all the nodes or edges appear on the path. So this function could be helpful when you are only interested in, in a subset of the node or edge property because returning all properties can make the query result hard to interpret if there are many properties appear for, for, for each node and edge. And the example here on the right shows uh, an example of returning name property of all the nodes on this path and the scenes property of all the rows on this path. So in the query result, you get a list of uh, strings and the list of uh, integers. We also made some improvement on recursive computation. Um, the biggest one is running filters on this uh, recursive pattern. And this feature is not part of new 4 So we adopt the uh, mem graph, or at least not, not for, Part of the open cipher, so we adopt the uh, mem graph syntax, which is like a unpack style of uh, syntax. So here we unpack the recursive pattern as a R and underscore R stands for the recursive recursive rel and underscore is the recursive node, and we can run a filter on this uh, unpacked variables. The query here is requiring all the edges being traversed in this recursive drawing to have year property greater than twenty twenty. So running filters on node is not available on the latest release, but should also come uh, shortly as well. So here, let me give a more detailed example of how to run this uh, filters in recursive joins. So here we are interested in the one to two hop uh, path that connect, connects from Adam to any other user. And based on this database, you can see that Adam can actually goes to all the three users, Carissa from this one hop path, John from this one hop path and Nora from this two hop path. So if we ignore the predicate, it can easily reach all three people. But now with this uh, predicate R dot since smaller than 2022, Adam can no longer reach Nora because the last edge that connecting to Nora has a since property equals to 2022, which doesn't qualify this uh, filter. So at the query results level, we only see Carissa and John as the reachability of uh, from Adam through this uh, recursive join. And we also have, uh, next we have call procedures. The, this call procedure gives you a way to query database schema level information. So in this example, we are querying the metadata for user table and return everything. In the query result, we get back a table with three co four columns. The property ID column in indicating their internal identifier within the database. We have the name and data type of each column and uh, uh, the last one indicates whether this column is a primary primary key column or not. And this uh, call procedure can actually be used in the same way as any other reading clause. So you could add uh, additional order by limit if you are only interested in the subset of this uh, result or even combine it with other clauses like an additional match clause afterwards. So, so far we only add a small number of uh, schema level functions as shown here in, in this table. But because the framework is ready, so adding more functions is, is quite easy for us. So do let us know if you are looking for other schema level information, but couldn't find it uh, in the latest release. So and, can you say what is current setting exactly? Our uh, current setting, so we have a database settings. In the next slide, I will introduce. So for example, you can return how many threads are currently available for query execution and what is the default timeout for, for your for your query. Um, uh, are these, sorry, just a question, are these table functions or or are they, um, like this, did they return, let's say a struct or, or some table-like structure or are they scalar? Uh, these scalar? are table functions. So they yeah. do return a table. So here return, yeah. like this function return a table with four columns and many rows. The number of rows equals to the number of uh, columns you define inside the user table. So yes, they are table functions. And for DB version, this one will just return you table with uh, one row, one column, so a single entry. So, but all of them oh, are okay. table. Okay, good. Okay. Um, and also call procedure is used to modify database configurations. In that sense, it's similar to SQLite Pragma, if you are a SQLite user. And the example here called thread equals to five will set the thread number, the thread for maximum thread for execution to, to five. So similar to the previous case, we also only expose a relatively small number of uh, configuration for now and more configurations can be added if uh, based on uh, feature request. 
so one thing I, I would like to mention here is that you might be curious why this core procedure is being used for both querying database schema and also modify database configurations. And the reason is uh, we, we try to comply with Neo4j and procedures in Neo4j can do both uh, type of things. So internally, we are still debating if uh, we will use a different keyword in order to differentiate the two use case. So the keyword for, for modifying database configuration might change in the, in, the, in the future release. And next we have the merge clause. Um, although merge clause can achieve the same effect uh, as Postgres observe or invert on conflict in many cases, but they are not the same thing. So merge clause giving a merge pattern will first try to match the pattern. And if matches are found, it returns all the matches. So in the first case, we try to merge a user atom and because Adam already exists in the database, we just return this uh, this user node with name equals to Adam and age equals to 30. And if you look at the count query executed after merge, uh, it returns four, which means we don't know use user node is being created after this uh, merge statement. And in case the merge the pattern is not found, um, then the full pattern will be created. So in the second case where we try to merge a user Bob inside the database because it doesn't exist, instead we have to create a user Bob inside the inside the database. So the count query will then return uh, four five instead of four, meaning there's an additional user node uh, being created after the merge. And just like in Postgres, we can specify the post conflicting behaviors through statement like insert on conflict to nothing. With merge, you can also specify the post create or post uh, match behavior. So in the first case, we define the post match behavior as set, set once a match, set the age property of n equals to 35. So if you look at the result of this query, instead of returning Adam 30 as the original user uh, specified in the database, we return Adam 35 because this uh, unmatch clause has been executed. Um, once the pattern is found in the database. And similarly, we can do an onCreate um, and set the age property of n equals to 60. If the user, if the pattern is not found and instead cre created. So if you look at the query results, we'll get back uh, Bob and with name 60 in this case. And here is a bit more complicated, complicated example for merge where we are interested in merging an edge rather than node. So at the very beginning, we try to look, find two users, Adam and John, and try to merge an edge between them with since property equals to 2022. And if you look at the database, there's already one edge between from Adam to John, but the since property equals 2020, which means the pattern here uh, does not exist in the database. So instead we have to create an edge from Adam to John with since property equals to 2022. So in the second read only query, when you query these edges between Adam and John, you will get back two edges, one with one the original one with since property equals 2020, and the new one you just created with the since property equals to 2022. So that's the merge clause. Yeah, we have a question, a question from Tom. Tom, do you want to ask your question? Yes. So I was just curious, you were showing us a a merge uh, that also had a, a creating a node. Um, is that a, a pattern that's already used uh, elsewhere? You know, it seems like this is uh, composable and so not fine, but I'm personally not huge on side effects. I see. Um, so, so like, like in other side, like you mean like in Neo4j? Yes. In yeah, other this, this is actually this the same. There's a like a, it's the same merge in Neo4j as they are currently using, like 100% uh, compatible. Um, okay. I'm not aware of other systems uh, that have exactly the same clause. Um, the, the most similar one is uh, is probably observed. So if you try to insert a node that already exists in a database, uh, um, it could uh, switch behavior like storing exceptions. Ignore the ignore the node itself or updating the property. So it's uh, the, the 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 most similar counterpart that I would say is absurd. But I'm not aware of an exact uh, same query class in other query language. The, there is um, just just to uh, not to take take over the conversation, but uh, 
actually in, in more modern data warehouses like BigQuery and, and Snowflake, there is a merge clause that works very similarly where you essentially define some some um, some statement and then you can merge based on the based on a property if that exists or not and then you can say on match on not match and yeah you can create or delete or, or insert the node which is very very similar to this this semantic and yeah in Postgres it's the on conflict which is a bit more it's a bit more cumbersome but you can kind of achieve the same the same result cool uh, any other questions so far Okay, so 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 let me let me continue. So there, there is a little bit more not so major feature, but might still be useful depending on your use case. So first, we start allowing multi-label delete and set. So in the first example, it's essentially setting all the nodes age property to twenty, and the second example is deleting all the nodes existing in the database, regardless uh, what 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 label it has or what table it it, it belongs to. So and we also, you want to say what happens if a like you got a node table that does not have an age property in the very first example, match a set a that age to 20. That if nothing it, will, yeah. If, if a table does not have age property, then no update will happen on that age table. So it's, it only, it will only update the tables with, with age property. Um, and we, second, we, we start allowing a return after update. So now you can immediately query the node that has just been created. And finally, we add a syntactic sugar to return all columns of a node or rel through this uh, star expression. So you don't have to explicitly write all the properties uh, anymore if there's many properties uh, exist for, for a node or rel. It could be uh, common to, to, to write. Uh, sorry, uh, just a, a small question on, on something that was done. You, so you, you're able to do filtering on, on recursive nodes that was previously. Does that also yeah. work the same? Let's say you would do a multi-label, like multiple nodes. Uh, would this also work the same that you're not going to fail if the property doesn't exist? It just, yeah. so what's, it, what's it, the it, semantic? The semantic is uh, uh, if, the, if a property does not exist for a particular label or a particular table, then it will be uh, marked as a null value uh, during processing. So essentially you are comparing, doing a filter on top of null, which default gives you back a null and interpret as a false. Uh, in according to SQL standard and also separate standard. Mm -hmm. uh, there is an sure. case there though that we should be aware of. Like if the predicate is null, then what do we do? Like suppose like you know you said you do a recursive query, right? Uh, and the recursive query is a filter in the syntax that you showed in the previous slide, and that filter is actually you know. Like e dot since is null. Any filter like, like any... Then, then, then no, but what I'm saying is if a table doesn't have the since property, then according to the semantics that you mentioned, it will actually pass every edge of that table. Will no, pass... it will fill every it will fill every edge of that table because uh, if Argo sense does not exist for a particular table, like suppose there follows table and likes table, likes table doesn't have since. Then this R dot since when the R is a, it's from the lex table, it becomes a null smaller than 2022. Oh, no. But, than... Yeah. What if the predicate was R dot since is null? Then it becomes an, then you, it becomes null is null, which evaluate as true. So everything will pass. So that's, that, but that, okay. That's, that might be a bit confusing though. That needs to be clarified because that might not be the intended. Like if the, so you could have another implementation or we could fix this where, if it just doesn't exist, somehow we always just return false on any filter. Mm -hmm. That could be another because it doesn't exist. Uh, the table doesn't have it. Although I don't know, actually, nulls are very has always been very confusing. But, 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 uh, but let's decide this internally. I think I did. I know, I know. But, but, but but I mean, uh, it's something to to be aware of. Like you know. I suggest uh, including in the documentation uh, just simple examples, because uh, this is always confusing. We're always going to have trouble remembering, but any behavior is fine. Um, I think the behavior, it sounds good. Um, yeah, I think we do okay. have... Uh, the, the, the least work is the principle to go here, which means whatever the semantics currently implemented is fine, but it might be good to document it at least. 
yeah, we do have documentation about multi-level update or multi-level read. But essentially, it's null behavior it is is the same as in your 4 j So if, in your 4 j if you don't try to have cover no, okay. the gap that doesn't exist, it will return null. Um, yeah. um, sorry, I had a question regarding the delete. So oh. if you delete the node, are you also de detaching the relationships, or that would be something aside? So just... in, in, you, if you try to delete a node that still have connected to, still have edge connected to them, so you will get a runtime exception. So you instead you you will try to have to first delete all the edges and then delete mm -hmm. all the nodes. Okay. So that's a current behavior. Detach delete will come in the next release. So later on you will see us talking about the detach delete part. Uh, okay. Will that be like a cas cascade kind of like in SQL? Uh. Not it's not cascade. Um, detach delete only detach the, the the immediate connected uh, edges uh, attached with the node. Um, I think if you try to delete in a cascade way, you you probably want to write. Mm. That's about yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 the file I don't key. Think we should support that. I don't think we should support like cascading things happen on triggers and whatnot. Otherwise, you specify a set of records and you want to delete them. So detach delete means delete the node and all of its edges. Not well. That's kind of what I meant, really. I I meant more like uh sorry, if it wasn't clear. Like I meant more a uh, a similar kind of syntax as in SQL, where where basically if you delete something, you delete all the foreign keys and things that kind of point to it, so you clean up the environment, which is kind of what we're talking about here, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. but only, only the immediate sort of uh, edges and not so 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 if if you if if you delete a node. Detach, delete a node that's got edges to maybe 10 other nodes. You just delete the edges. You don't delete those other 10 nodes, even though they no longer have edges anymore. Yeah, so, that makes sense because the, the graph, as long as the graph is consistent, I guess that's kind of the important part. So like, yeah, it's not the same semantics. I understand your question. It's not the same semantics as foreign, foreign keys. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <clears throat> uh, all right. Okay. So, so, so next, let me introduce some features um, that are not part of OpenCypher or Neo4j, but these are features that you would uh, usually expect it to see in a relational system. So, first is the data type. We have added three more data types: blob, map, and union. Blob is used to store binary data, so it can be very flexible because anything can be stored in this uh, binary format. And map is a dictionary dictionary of key value dictionary of key value pairs, and it's similar to struct or composite type if you are a Postgres user. And th the difference is that map does not require the same set of keys to present for each row. So it will be uh, more flexible and helpful if the, the set of keys of a column is not fixed or can change at the runtime. And we also implement union primarily for our RDF uh, features. It is similar to C union or C++, C++ 17 standard variant, meaning it's capable of holding multiple values, but at, at, at a single time point, only one of the value will be valid. So we need this to store and process RDF constant values because RDF, RDF constant values can be of any data type like date, string, float. And so later on when we, when we expose uh, uh, RDF features, you will see more and more usage uh, related to this uh, union data type. And we also added create macro clause that allows user to define customized functions through existing expressions and functions that are, that are available in the system already. So in this example, we create a macro at with default that takes two mark, two parameters a and b. The second parameter takes a default value of three. And the macro itself is defined as returning the sum of uh, a and b. So you can call it with single parameter. In which case, the default value will be fact. So it will return two plus three. And if you call it with two parameters, it will just overwrite the default value and returns four plus seven. So there's more powerful use cases related to this uh, macro. You can uh, find it on, on, on our website. And we but also now support- yeah, Maybe uh, Martin has a question on maps. So maps. Is, uh, he just wants to double check that they're not typed at all. So they're like, they're the string key with any value where the value could be of any, any data type. So you could create a map where the key is A and the value is a string and the second key is B and the value is an int. Uh, no, like all the keys and all the values must be must be of the same data type. So it's uh yes. What do you mean? 
So in this DDL data types map, so in the DDL, it requires a, a data type for the keys and the data type for the values. So in, in, in this case, it requires all the uh, key to have string data type and all the values to have int64 data type. Because internally, it's still a struct implementation. It's actually a list of struct implementation. So we do require. What is the difference? Uh, so can you clarify then? What did you mean? The difference with this struct? You meant you you said that the keys don't need to have the same type or something. What, what did you mean by that? No, I maybe. So, so okay. I so let me also. The meaning. Sorry, what? <laughs> I think that might have been a crossover with the uh, union discussion. Yeah, you scroll uh, to the slides. Let's just tell you where the confusion is. Go to your slide. You're you're not seeing your slides. Okay, wait, wait. Okay, uh, yeah. so, so um, somebody... similar to struct, but does not require same key for each row. What do you mean? So it that does not require the same set of key to present. So the key, the key okay. can be A or B, but it needs to be a string. So this type so, is fixed. The values no, no. type is fixed. So let, 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 let me rephrase myself. So if you define a struct as yeah, we got uh, it. Yeah. Column, yeah. yeah, so if you define a struct as column A and B, I, a struct with a to 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 field A and B, then A and B must pre must present for each and every single row inside this uh, inside the table with this struct column. And right. if you define a map, a map doesn't doesn't really specify whether how many column how many fields exist. Uh, so you could have one row that only has A, another row only has B, and and yet another row contains A B C. So within each row, you could have an arbitrary number of uh, key value pairs, but the data type constraint holds. Like uh, once you define your DDL, if you define your key to be string type, then every key has to be string data type. Let me just uh, be uh, rephrase this. So if you have say a map property for each node and you got three nodes, right? One of them could have only, and then so you define the uh, key, the data type of the key and the value. But node one could have all the suppose it's string and int. Node one could have string A with uh, value one, node two could have string A with value two, and node three could have string A value one, string B value two. So it's a map, so it could contain multiple things. So when he says each row, he means each node, for example, that is a map, could have multiple string int key value pairs in it. And, uh, you know, they could, each different nodes could have different size maps. Yeah, but if you have a struct, like it's like you, you predefine exactly all the fields that will exist for every node. Yeah. Yes. Um, all right, so at the very end, I just want to mention we start uh, support data exports through copy two. And the semantic is you try to copy a, a statement result to a, to a CSV file. Um, Parquet is on its way. It's not included in the as part of this release because uh, there's a little bit uh, thing about an nested data type that wasn't complete. But we, we at this point in this release, we do support copy statement to a CSV file. So within this uh, parenthesis, it's a statement itself, just like a regular Ceph query you would Right, and the output CSV file will match exactly the your statement output. So that's for the data export. Um, next, I will let Gordon take over to talk about our API changes, storage optimization, and our roadmap for the rest of 2023. <clears throat> All right, so I will continue here. So I'll first talk about our, um, just one sec, sorry. I need my controls. Yeah, so let me introduce our change in APIs, storage design, and also we, uh, some internal optimization that we did in the last two months. So we added two new language bindings, uh, Java and Rust. So basically based on our previous user demands and uh, help you guys uh, enjoy it. And in also in the C++ side, we now support creating both scalar and vectorized UDFs. So here is an example of uh, creating and using a scalar UDF. 
to add each person eight by five. And of course, then you can, uh, if you're familiar and comfortable with our internal data structure, you can also uh, make use of the vectorized UDF interface to uh, do more advanced processing. I don't want to go into details on this, and instead you can take a look at our documentation. And there is also one minor change that I want to highlight is that I, I, we like, on, can you clarify why would you want to vectorize one so so that people understand if you're adding a UDF in C plus plus, you know why would you yeah. want to vectorize one? Yeah, so uh, internally, like we we do have vectorization inside our query processor natively. So like if you if you for take this scalar UDF as an example, so this would be like if the um, chance stands that we can vectorize this, we would apply this function in a vectorized way. So kind of in a tight for loop. And then in this case, for this exact example, this two UDF would achieve similar uh, uh, results in terms of performance. And the difference is that vectorized uh, interface can give more control, like how you can interact with nested data types. Uh, right now, because we have some limitations on that, you cannot create new strings because they are using overflows and it needs access to value vector and also for some other nested data types. So that's one case. And another case is that if you are really familiar with our query processing site and you know exactly the state of each value vector, like whether it's flat or unflat, so you can take control and do more uh, optimized, write more optimized code. Yeah, but that's really for very advanced uh, users. Basically, you should, you should probably do it only if you did a UDF in Scalar and it wasn't fast and you wanted to do something faster. You can then ask us or you know send us a message and we can maybe see if there is a faster way of doing yeah. it in a vectorized way. There was yeah. a mention of support for uh, Python and Rust. Um, so C++, that's where you could write UDF. Um, what what can I do with these uh, other uh, languages? Uh, right now we like right now the only way is to go through Cypher. So you can do through create macro. And the limitation is that you need to define your functions based on uh, like our built-in functions. Like you can you can have maybe add you can have uh, plus minor and, and those things that we have and define on top of them for your uh, macros. And for Python and Rust and other languages, there is no currently uh, um, way that for you to uh, create UDF. So that needs to wait a bit. Yeah, but it's on our roadmap. Thanks. All right. So yeah, back to the minor, uh, minor change is that we extended one API that was originally only in the Python side to all of the C, C++ and Rust side. So that API is to convert query results uh, into error arrays and should be able to uh, allow better data exchange between Kuzu and the other systems or libraries. Yep, so next I will- The question was a quick, there's a quick question on, on this one is, uh, um just just like curious i mean i know there's a lot or it's kind of complex but if you have the ability to convert the result to an arrow array uh, in c++ wouldn't it then be fairly straightforward to export that arrow uh like arrow data set to par parquet or is there something else that's kind of uh, lacking to do that if you already have that capability uh, it's actually, so can you clarify like export to Parquet, you mean export to Parquet files or you mean export Yeah, exactly, to just, just as, as you, memory. I mean, it's not, not, not like a huge thing, just, just curious to, because the, um, you have the, you just showed the export to, to CSV, which is, is, uh, is nice. And then you said that there are some work in progress that's not done yet to par yeah. Parquet, but if you already have Arrow, the ecosystem already, like it, it supports fairly, fairly well. So just curious if there are some kind of blockers there that uh, is a bit more devil in the details or if it's just not prioritized yet. Yeah, I think, um, so that's certainly 
doable. Like so, the the API we have right now is that you can convert queries into a in memory arrow object, and um, you can we can like further uh, convert that to Parquet and through arrow library. And the thing that we are not going that way right now is mainly because we are considering getting rid of the arrow dependency. Actually, so we have started on uh, writing our own CSU reader and uh, also taking reference from DuckDB. And so it will be the same for Parquet later. And we don't want to um, like add that extra dependency when we're going to remove arrow because that requires that we depend on arrow library. That's my understanding. Yeah, it makes sense. It's uh, it's kind of what I was guessing. I think I saw some conversations that it adds a lot of bloat also to the to the client libraries as as we kind of see in Rust, for instance. So yeah, make, makes total sense. Yeah. All right. So uh, next, I will just explain briefly on our change on the storage layout, and we have mentioned this in our last year's meeting that we are going to rework our storage layout on top of our new design called node group based storage. And in the last release, we have moved our node tables into the new design. And so briefly, the idea is that before the last release, we actually store our columns and tables into multiple files separately and take a node table person here as an example. So it contains like uh, two columns, one is string and another one is integer. But each column would have a main column file and plus a now file and for string we also have an extra overflow file. So for this table we would have like totally in total file on these files. And this is not scalable because tables can be very wide and database can contain many tables and we used to run into uh, errors like too many open files and uh, due to this. And most importantly, this design is not good for uh, data compression. So we decided to uh, move away from this design and into a new node group based storage design. So the idea is to partition the tables into multiple node groups. And for you, for guys you are familiar with Parquet, so it's um, similar to the concept of a row group. And each of which is a horizontal partition of the table and would consist around 131k tuples. So then we would naturally have each column be partitioned into multiple chunks. So we can get the flexibility that each chunk can be compressed and decompressed independently and also can be skipped when we do the scan if we have the zone map. Now we actually, in the last release, we can store all of the columns from uh, all of the node tables into a single data KZ file. And this can enable more compression. So we only shift the uh, uh, well, minor compression that's compressing the now and Boolean values from one byte per, per value to one bit per value. And we're working on integer compression right now. So Ben is the, our compression guy. And we should be able to get this out in our sep September release. Yeah, so besides the optimization on our storage side, we also introduced one uh, major optimization on the query processor side, which which is to our next correlated subqueries. And if we, if we consider the following query, that's trying to find names of users A who have at least one user B younger than A. So um, A to AG is like both existing in the out query and in the inner query. And the naive way to, ev to evaluate this query is to run in a query uh, over and over again for each binding of the A to H value. And this is essentially to perform nested loop joins and can be very slow in many cases. Alternatively, so we introduced organizations that we evaluate the inner, inner query only once for all of the possible um, auto binding values of A to H. And then we can join the result of that with the other query through hash joins. So this would get rid of the nest loop uh, based way of uh, join evaluation. And I don't want to go into technical details on this, but for anyone interested, you can like find the exact ideas that we implemented in Thomas Newman's paper on nesting arbitrary queries. So that's all for 
our important features and optimizations in, in the last two months. Next, I'm going to give a quick preview of our, our next major release in September. And the first set of features that we want to enhance our copy statement a little bit more. And there are three features around that. First one is to support uh, copy query result into Pycrete files. And the second one is to support copy from remote file systems. Uh, we will just get started with uh, S3 first. And the last one is to remove the restriction that uh, we limit that each table can only be copied once when it's empty. And this will hopefully provide much better experience for backloading. Another two uh, major features that's in our plan uh, are like direct scan from files. So this one is to enable more usable uh, back updating. And uh, the last one is in the schema level, we want to introduce the defining real table among multiple node table pairs. So for example, you can define a real table R that's having two uh, node table pairs between A from A to B and also from A to C. So we don't really expect you to, to define too many pairs in, in, in such way like uh, if you define tens of thousands or like a million pairs, uh, we will not be optimized for those uh, use cases initially. And But do let us know if you have use cases on that, we can uh, discuss more. Yeah, so besides new features, uh, there are... Uh, Martin, I think, has a question. Can you clarify your question, Martin, for the... Uh, yeah, I mean, I had, had a couple. The first one was funny because you kind of, I was like, oh, it, this is really kind of exciting because it could enable uh, direct uh, direct scan of files and kind of doing upserting uh, directly from uh, from a file. Uh, I guess this is a bit more similar to what like is supported in, in more modern data warehouses where you can query a file directly, transform it, and then kind of insert it or, or upsert it directly. But this this so this would be really uh, interesting uh, in relation to the kind of merge functionality, which from what I understand is more about a single single kind of insert or, or merge at the moment. It's not like a batch or, or bulk operation. Yeah, so this is like the beginning of that, I think being yeah. able to take data from a file and uh, and sort of insert it into a table in bulk and things like that. Uh, hopefully we'll do we'll do more. Like we've got a data frame maybe maybe and we'll be hopefully be able to query from it and do stuff like take the entire data frame and insert it as a table, as a node table, for example, things like that. Uh, but this is the simplest to start with. Yeah, this is the beginning yeah. of those features. Yeah. That's so just super exciting. Hyper edges, that's the one I was asking a question about. What did you mean by that? Are you referring to the create rel table from A to B, A to C, that one? Yes, yes. But that's not really hyper edges in, 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 as in like a relationship between like three nodes or something. It's more like oh, so okay. you, have a, uh, you have a relationship uh, and it's called uh, um, likes and you got, I don't know, um, people and animals as two node types. And people can like people, but people can also like animals. Like right now, we force you to pick a single source node table and a single destination node table. But suppose you want to use the same label likes for multiple. Ah, yeah, I got it. Got it. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of a syntactic sugar for you to say likes for me uh, is between these possible pairs. Now we had this in the very beginning. Back in last November, when we first released, we had this feature, and in the last minute, we weren't really liking it. Uh, so we, uh, because it actually really, at, the, at least at the code that we had back then, it uh, did complicate the system. Uh, so we kind of removed it to release a simpler code base. But there was a sort of a couple demands for this. I think Xiang said like four different people mentioned that they'd like to do something like this in Slack or on GitHub. So we decided to put put back a syntactic sugar, at least, so you can do this and uh, will support the querying and whatnot. And what Godong was saying is that, you know, the way this will be supported is that we'll have multiple for each possible pair. We'll have a multi, we'll have a separate table. So, which means that if you have 
a very large number of pairs, like, you know, 100,000 pairs or something, you know, that will probably stress test the system. So, you know, anyways, most people won't be there yet, but uh, at least the way we'll implement this may have some scalability problems, but not at this, not at, not at the low level, low kind of low scales. That's the point he was trying to make. Yeah. Any other questions? It appears syntactic, syntactic group, yeah. All right, I think I will continue. Um, yeah, we were talking about uh, new optimizations. So we will continue working on our not group based design and finish the part for real tables. So then we would have a complete new storage layout. And also that will come together with the compression for integers. And on the query processor side, we will introduce the optimization to uh, basically transform the autobind and limit clause into top K operators. So if you have uh, this kind of queries, this optimization should be able to speed us a lot. Yeah, so that's for that's a quick pre preview for our September release. And lastly, but also importantly, let's revisit our 2023 plan. And so first thing is open site for feature completeness. Uh, so this has always been our top priority. And we I would say that we are getting close to that. And we have started on the regression test, which will give us a way to quantify how close we are in terms of the feature completeness. And at this point, we know for sure that uh, there are four major missing clauses currently in our system. First one is detached delete. So uh, Xiang and Martin has already covered that part. So this would allow us to delete a node along with all of the collected edges. The second one is core subquery. So this allows us to run more rich features on subquery uh, in the same way as SQL does. And the third is load series three. And this will come in September release. And although uh, I don't think we, we would still call it load series three because it's not actually just CSV files. We would also cover it for packet files. And the last one is use graphs that allows us to switch between different graphs. And we don't have a, a plan to support it in the very near future. But if you have a use case or demand on this, please let us know. And this is certainly doable. Yep, so on the story side, again, we have finished change to no table and uh, change to real table and uh, compression for, in for integers will come in September. And there are some things we haven't get started yet, uh, like screen compression over screens and the maps and the query processing over compressed intermediate results. But gradually we will uh, ship all of them. As for RDF, we have been talking about this for a while. And the good news is that we have made progress on our, our research prototype. And as you can see, now we can create RDF graph, backloading from total files and run self queries like joins, applications, and autobies. So Xia is going to take the lead to migrate from the prototype into our master. And hopefully we'll get the first version out quickly. So for realization, uh, Chang is the engineer behind this, although he, he is traveling these days, so we can't uh, get a demo here. But at this point, uh, we can say that the first version of our revision tour is on the way, and we will be ha very happy to take feedback uh, for those interested in this. Yeah, and there are also some uh, other long-term features we have planned, but not yet getting started on. Uh, the first is the memory mode. So we already have a GitHub issue out there. And uh, we're also considering bringing UDF more APIs, as we discussed, such, on, such as Python and Rust. And the extension framework is also very important to us. So it allows us to decouple some of our internal components and also enable anyone who's like developing on top of Kuzu that's trying to extend some of Kuzu ability so they can do it more easily. And the next two longer term features are to do direct scan and load from in-memory objects like um, Pandas, PyArrow, and also from external systems like Ciclet and Postgres. So yeah, lastly, as always, we're happy to add more integration with third-party libraries as long as they fit into our roadmap. 
So we are considering uh, libraries like Paulos and Icebot. Yeah, so yeah, there so... you can get some feedback on these because some of these are not very well informed. Yeah. Frank, some of these are things that we are thinking, but we don't know if uh, there's a corresponding need for it uh, or utility uh, of some of these uh, libraries uh, or, uh, yeah. Plan or the libraries will support and these are the ones we want to support and we leave it to the community and things like that. So we need to make sure that whatever we do is sustainable. So we don't want to say yes to everything, but we also want to be a system that integrates with more uh, sort of graph analytics libraries uh, that are popular or, or, or growing popular. Um, so that's kind of a discussion for us too. Yeah. So that's that's the major thing. And lastly, that we are just trying to uh, build our community here. And we, like, as you can tell, we are, we are not that very experienced yet. So uh, please help us a bit if you can spread the word for us. So like, if you can, you can post us on social media, if you can't, if you have something, you have done something on top of Kuzu and you want, you'd like to write it out, so uh, we're happy to host Ghost right on our blog. And we're also trying to reach out more through uh, Meetup and Tech Talks. And please pass our names. And if you know any uh, conferences or, or Meetups that Kuzu can speak out, please, please, please let us know. So that's, that's it. And we'll take questions and feedbacks. You can stay yes. another five minutes if you have questions, feedback. Um, Just brief comment. Um, this looks great. I love that y'all are uh, continuing to uh, resist saying yes to things. And even if you're adding, uh, relying on external libraries and just doing integrations, that's great because we're gonna keep asking you to put more and more and more in, especially things that are in hype right now, like uh, LLM, vector da database, um, Keep saying no, keep, I loved, it was <laughs> great hearing you removed a dependency. That was wonderful. Uh, keep it up, this looks good. Uh, Paco, were you gonna say something? Prashant also raised uh, his hand. No, I, I was just agreeing vehemently with Tom. Thank you very much and perfect, per, very well stated. Okay, yeah, Prashant, you had a comment? Uh, yeah, yeah. Hi, sorry. I'm, I know I'm late, and I'll definitely cast a recording later. But um, I was just wondering when can I try out the preview of the the, the visualization front end? You said that was like early stage. Like just for like uh, I'm trying to understand how it would work, and maybe just uh, use it on one of my example cases internally. So um, is there any kind of version I can work with? Uh, not that I know of. Just Chung is working on it, and Chung is with family in okay. in, in China. So, uh, but he's active, like that's his main thing. And Chang uh, delivers. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so, so we'll have to wait for him to tell us when he thinks he can he can do it. Uh, but uh, no worries. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll follow up on. With certainly, you. certainly within this year, probably uh, in a couple months. And um, he did okay. demo a couple things to us, but I don't. I really don't know. I don't 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 have an insight because it's technology. I I have no idea about those front end stuff. Does anyone know? Yeah, it's super, super interesting to see where that goes because yeah, I think that that genuinely would be the, I really think that's the biggest thing that would get Kuzu in the hands of the average person out there because um, I think the challenge with graphs is people want to see what they're building. So uh, just writing code, like queries through a code uh, editor is I guess one step, but then the additional step on top of that is to experiment and run you know queries on the graph and see what you're getting. I mean, on, on the Viz side, there's but, such a range of what's yeah. used. It's it's difficult to... Yeah, so, so actually, Paco, uh, good side. point. But do you find that it takes a lot of custom code to do that? Because if I, if I output, let's say, a table of results from Cypher, uh, from using Kuzu, how, like, just PyViz on its own seems to require a lot of boilerplate and custom loops and, you know, a bunch of things to write all that boilerplate. I, so if is you there can, anything you're I, using as a shortcut? Well, I mean, if you can export node link, you can usually get out to most of the other kinds of visualization methods pretty readily. And and PyViz is your is your go-to. What's your favorite uh, option? 
Um, I mean, for me, if I am developing something that has, you know, feature extensions, PyViz is very nice because uh, it's okay. JavaScript, it's not really heavyweight, uh, and I can extend it a lot for what's needed in the UI. However, it doesn't really have much of a state machine. I, I mean, it's kind of a toy in some ways. Um, definitely, okay. there there are really extensive visualization frameworks if you want to go into that. Um, uh, I, is pretty interesting. Uh, Graphistry, et cetera. You know, we've worked with a lot of these. Uh, I, I think there are some low hanging fruits here, though, because you know, if you look at what's there, there's there's already something that that processes into a graph uh, network X in Python, which essentially is a deduped set of nodes and edges with all the properties. So putting that in fast API and, and setting up. So I think there are probably some, I would assume that some like the, the avenue that's being being pursued here. And then and then there are in both React and Vue and, and different uh, front end libraries, there are um, options for visualizing a graph kind of given a set of nodes and edges, which is very much similar to what the Neo4j editor does. You write a cipher and you get this D3 graph where you can drag the nodes around. Which I think is, you know, uh, probably a good good starting point. And then uh, everyone would probably have different needs. But I think just seeing it in that that simplified way with the property. Yeah, no, what be, I mean uh, is like a, a a no code or low code solution for doing this for the average developer who is just interested in working with data and not writing custom front ends. So yeah, I mean, that's, I what I mean. that's what I mean. That's what I mean is that this yeah. could be this this could be like the visualization front end that could just be spun up or, or run like as a docker image for anyone that that uh, uh, wants to, to use it 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 might be more effective though in terms of time for for kuzu just to kind of give a heads up to some of the popular uh uh visualization frameworks to say hey would you be interested in building adapter because ah. a lot of them already support neo and just sort of say hey look we're very close in fact we're going to be even more performant in some ways uh like, like graphic help. history is a good example yeah i know they support neo4j well i mean yeah. they need node link and i mean that's trivial because that's the internal representation of tables anyway <laughs> kuzu already I, I think that if you talk with with uh, Leo, you know, at graph, I mean, if you want, I can introduce you to a lot of the the visualization people, and just give them a heads up because they're usually more than happy to build the adapters for their own reasons. Awesome, yeah, that's good. Good to know. That would be a particularly helpful. Also, also, let me add one more point. So last time when I talked to Chang about this visualization, I think the first version will come approximately September fifteenth, like. Around that, hmm. yeah. So it's, awesome, uh, it's great to know. Thanks a lot, Christian. Yeah, of course. All right. Um, any other questions? I think Sammy has dropped off. Like he apparently has something else to do. So I'll take take take, take over the 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 host at this point. All right. Um, questions, suggestions. Your mute is uh, Paco, so we didn't hear. Us. Oh, no worries. I just I just wanted to encourage and say this is really excellent progress. Um, I'm I'm glad to see uh, so much of what's going on the other language bindings, uh, RDF support, etc. Cool. Maybe just yeah, one kind of thing from from us and, and our team at Alvin is that our bread and butter is very much kind of visualizing. Uh, potentially large scale uh, graphs uh, with, with nodes and edges. So, so if you have more specific kind of questions, or or when you kind of get a bit further on the UI, we obviously would be more than ha happy to to help out there with recommendations on the frameworks and and I think also especially performance considerations when it comes to rendering and layout, which, which is usually a big hurdle when you when you work with, uh, with with huge graphs. So it's not just processing the the data that's like the easy part and then laying out 20,000 nodes in, in a browser can be a daunting uh, challenge so yeah 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 that I heard the same thing from Chan as well like the, the algorithm converge very very slow at, at a large scale so. mm -hmm. all right cool yeah um so, go ahead now I was going to say that's something we we rely on the community that's the thing we're trying to build here <laughs> So bring lots of things that we don't have much expertise in. Cool. Uh, all right. Uh, and I guess thank you everyone for your participation and looking forward to more interaction uh, through the Slack in the future.